Hi there, I'm Simon St. Lawrence, Senior Editor at O'Reilly Media Inc. I'm here today with Neil Ford. He's, he's been doing a series of video courses for us, uh, Functional Thinking, Closure Inside Out, and he's really bringing functional programming to a much broader group of people, making it more approachable in a world where we need it but can't always figure it out. So, so Neil, let's, let's talk about this transition. Okay. Uh, I, I grew up programming AppleSoft Basic. Mm -hmm. uh, deep, deeply imperative universe. And yep. how, how do people make that jump from imperative to function? Well, I mean, it's just this inevitable jump. You know, in, in software, we always build layers of abstraction to, to abstract away details because it's just too messy to deal with the details all the time. So, one of the nice things that Basic gave you was not having to worry about memory management, but then you probably went to C or C++, and now you're in the weeds with plumbing again. Well, right now, we're very accustomed to imperative programming, so we're used to doing things in like imperative for loops and doing things very in a very detailed, very algorithmic kind of way. And you eventually figure out, as computer scientists did, that you know every time you do an iteration, whatever operation you're doing in there, it falls into a broad category of things. In fact, there's a category theory around yes. things like that. And if you can capture those, it's almost like design patterns, but at a more fundamental level, because you're looking at you know, these patterns of how you do iteration or filtering or uh, summing uh, or you do some sort of transformation on lists and it's just that next step of abstraction up that all developers eventually need to take because our runtimes now have enough horsepower to allow us to take that extra step and so all the languages now support these higher order functions. Even Java now in 8 will, yes. is going to finally support this so there's no excuse to well, keep doing iteration. Virtually every time you do iteration now with a for loop or an iterator you could probably replace that with some sort of transformation. And there are huge benefits to doing that. One of the great examples I saw recently in the Java 8 space was, let's say that you have this operation where you have a list of names and you need to sort them all and you need to capitalize them uh, and then filter down by a certain letter and then you know pin Mr. to the front of all of them. Well, if you do that in an imperative fashion, you end up touching a lot of them. You either do them all, uh, you know, touch each one multiple times, or you do them all in one big fat loop and do all these operations at one time. Of course, if you do them in streams in Java 8, Java 8 can actually optimize and say, well, you know what, let's do the filter before we do any of the others because we'll do less work on the others because we have a smaller set. So no matter what order you put them there in, it's smart enough to realize that, oh, there's a more efficient way to do this. That's exactly the higher level of abstraction we'd like to be working at because we don't need to be dealing with those details. Somebody else needs to worry about that, yeah, well, like it, a language. It, it seems like lambdas are going to make a big difference in the way people approach solving problems in Java. And it, it's interesting to me because it's I mean, it is a substantial technical change, but it's not really like tearing down the language and rebuilding. It's adding one piece, but suddenly the patterns for building software can shift really drastically once well, you've got that. In many ways, it's removing Band-Aids. So Lambda's replaced the command design pattern forever. There's no yes. need whatsoever for the command design pattern in a language like Lambda. So a lot of the things that we think are kind of you know core abstractions that you build things with mm -hmm. are really just there to address deficiencies in the abstractions that were laid down as kind of the, the foundation right. of some of these things. And, and I think that's why there's still a lot of experimentation in languages because you know languages define the building blocks for your abstraction and it's it's really hard to anticipate you know when you look at a language what it's going to be like to actually program in because you know it's all these very interesting building blocks right and it's interesting the uh, the combinatorial explosion of how those blocks fit together is fascinating so I think C sharp is really fascinating in that regard because they've added so much to it over time and I've always said that and I've never actually flown a helicopter but I've heard people who flown a helicopter so that it's really difficult because you have one thing with each hand and one thing with each foot, and they all they're all coupled <laughs> to one another, and so it's really hard. Well, I think languages are like that. Every mm -hmm. time you add a feature, it's coupled to every other feature, right. and you get this weird side effects in all sorts of unusual places. Yeah, well, it seems also like I, I talk to people. Java programmers are actually where I find most of the. I really want functional programming because I think they've realized they've kind of hit a wall maybe in their abstractions. Um, in, or they just, they just think it sounds cool. Well, that, that too. I mean, <laughs> Lambda, we've got to have it. That's right. Uh, the, it always seems like in most languages there's some way to do functional programming. Mm -hmm. But then there's also a category of languages which is really centered on functional programming. Yeah. And so, I mean, you're, you're working with Clojure, which is also you know, sort of popular in the Java world for interfacing nicely with uh, that, that infrastructure. But 
Well, Talk closure, about the switching invention. Yeah, closure has an interesting perspective because a lot of languages that are trying to seduce you into switching to them do so by making themselves multi-paradigm. We'll keep supporting the way you're doing coding and right. we'll gradually entice you into doing this better programming style somewhere else. Uh, closure doesn't seem to be designed that way. The, right. the design decisions around closure seem to be, let's make all the right engineering decisions. And you know, if it's a little bit, if there's a little bit of an impedance mismatch with the history, that's because history was wrong about some things. And it's right. a very opinionated place, but you know, Rich Hickey's a very smart guy and he has some really interesting opinions. And one of the things that he's done, and I think is really valuable in closure, even if you don't end up doing any closure development, is the way that he's rethought so much of the kind of core assumptions that you make mm -hmm. that were made 30 years ago about how languages, how computers, how storage work. And those assumptions are no longer valid at all, and yet they're still the largest constraints on many of our systems. So you look at, for example, the database they designed, Datomic, which is designed by the Closure Core guys. It's an immutable database, which is weird to think about at first, but then you think about, well, why are you doing destructive updates in a relational right. database because you're destroying trending data? Well, you had to do that because hard drive space is very expensive and right. precious and you can't waste that. And so we build all this complexity around being able to do destructive updates and locking and all that stuff where now if space is, for all practical purposes, practically infinite, why bother with that extra complexity and you can actually build much simpler systems if you separate those responsibilities and closure in a lot of places architecturally within the language have separated responsibilities. That's one of the ways that the, the uh, concurrency and parallelism is so elegant in the language is the way they've separated the responsibility of you know, representing values versus referencing those values. Right. So it's a really, really interesting design choices inside. So if you're a developer, well, well, a traditional imperative developer, what, what path do you think is, is wise for them to be exploring now? I mean, lambdas aren't quite here yet in Java. Um, there are a variety of different languages, and I, I kind of find people with different comfort levels. Yep, that's absolutely true. And I, I've, I've come to view, I don't think there is one true language that will appeal to everyone, just because, so computer languages and writing software is both engineering, but it's also craft. And so if you look at another craft like writing, some people are natural poets. Some people are natural novel writers. Some people are natural short story writers. Those are different medium that they feel most comfortable in. Mm -hmm. I think computer language is the same way. I think fundamentally some people are going to feel safer in statically typed, you know, very strongly mm -hmm. statically typed languages. And some people really like dynamically typed yeah. languages. So <laughs> I don't think there is one true path for anyone. I think it's more having to do with what's your comfort zone with brand new things. So if you're a Java developer, say, and you really want to start dipping your feet into this world, Groovy is a great place to do that mm -hmm. because it's very Java-like. They have unfortunately have some odd names for some common operations like reduce and filter, but that's fine. They, they right. work perfectly fine. <clears throat> so Groovy is a nice choice. If you want to bend your mind a little bit more, Ruby also has all these functional yes. constructs in it, attached to collections, et cetera. Or if you really want to start bending your mind, you know, Scala is a much different syntactically and it has a very interesting design decisions internally about the way it works and you know, type inferencing and a lot of sophisticated machinery there. And then of course you can go all the way to closure, which is really uh, a fundamentally a different way of thinking about problems. One of the things I tried to get across in my workshop yesterday is that when your abstractions are at such a high level like they are in closure, then I showed an example in Java that had a couple of imperative loops in it, you know, it was doing some mm -hmm. decisioning. And then I wrote that in a in closure, and each one of the bodies of those methods collapsed to a single line of code, which means that it basically just became an assignment. And so then it became one function that said, well, do these three assignments up top to build up these intermediate values, and there's a condition statement that says what to do when these things are true. And I think that's true in a lot of cases if you can get far enough along that functional programming path, you'll start seeing that the amount of code that you write actually starts collapsing down at a remarkable rate because you are working at a better high, at level yeah, of attraction. That, that kind of rewriting seems like a good way to, to learn how it transforms your code. Absolutely, particularly if you can work with someone who's already experienced with that paradigm and you know, the building blocks in that place, that really ramps you up fast. So even if you're not a big pair programmer, maybe it's not a bad idea to find somebody to pair with and do some functional programming just to see how they would solve a problem and how they would attack that particular style of problem. That sounds wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully we'll see a lot more people next year actually doing functional programming. All right, and, we hope so. Uh, we'll move forward. Thanks a lot. Thank you.